opportunity and I'm here on behalf of the Warwick Economic Summit um, with Dr. David Mulford, Vice Chairman International of Credit Suisse and former US Ambassador uh, to India. Um, welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, it's very, very nice to meet with you. Um, so I guess my first question is, um, I guess we've had a very tumultuous beginning to 2016, both economically uh, and politically. Um, what would you say is your outlook for the remainder of the year? My outlook uh, for the remainder of the year is, I would say, um, very, very concerned about the confluence of different events and different forces that are coming into play at this time. And I have what you might call a somber attitude towards the year. I'm not very upbeat. I'm not pessimistic to the point of thinking there's going to be a massive crisis all of a sudden. But I am distinctly nervous and concerned about the, the interaction and confluence of these different events that are taking place in the world today, all at the same time. It presents quite a challenge. I mean, what would you say policymakers, politicians, etc., need to be doing to kind of help alleviate some of these issues and how we can best move past them? Well, I would say a couple of things. First of all, they need to face up to reality, which is very hard to do in politics and government but understand that some of the things that are happening are really earth-changing events and face up to that and deal with it up front and on a cooperative basis with other, other leaders so that they, <clears throat> they have the necessary cooperation <coughs> that it takes to solve these problems. Unfortunately, the problems are not soluble. They are manageable, maybe but that you can't solve them. They're too big to be solved all of a sudden. Um, so yeah, what would you say was probably the, the biggest, the, the issue that's having the biggest impact? Um, no, it's a group of issues. Um, you can think of it this way. The Federal Reserve has acted now, finally. And by acting, it's causing a problem in global markets that is going to be very difficult to manage. Uh, for emerging market countries as well as developed countries. And <clears throat> the, the second thing is the massive migration that has started. And we see it already as a major problem, <clears throat> but it is just the beginning, in my view, of a movement that will continue for years, unless you believe the Middle East is going to be stabilized, which I don't. Um, and it also is a question of, in that context, the stress that that problem puts on Europe, the uni unity of Europe, the management of the Euro, the management of the EU, because there are divisions now in the European community that are north-south, been around for a while, Greece and Spain and yeah. so on. <clears throat> but there's also east-west divisions on the questions of managing these flows of people, dealing with Russia, and the whole concept of free movement in Europe, which is coming under challenge. Do you agree with the Fed's timing? Or? My frank opinion on the Fed is that I have never been supportive of the QE programs. The Fed performed a very valuable service in 08 and 09 in putting liquidity into the system at a time of crisis. Then the United States exited uh, recession late in 2009. And at that point, the Federal Reserve decided it was going to go on with liberal monetary policies, QE1, QE2, etc. Um, my view is that that was a great mistake on the part of the Federal Reserve because easy money became a global feature. Other central banks went in the same way. And they advertised this policy as one that would create growth and jobs. It has done neither in the United States on any scale. Uh, but it has flooded markets with liquidity. 
George Soros re uh, recently commented that he thinks we we may be heading for another um, major financial crisis. <coughs> Are you in agreement or? Uh, I'm not really with the that comment if what he means is we're going to have the same crisis all over again. Mm. Crises tend each to be different and that crisis came out of the subprime market, mortgage market in the United States. Um, it spread. Um, it, it, it didn't have the same components as we have today. Our capacity today to have a crisis is in fact much greater because it's a much more global threat that we face. I personally think we're not on the edge of crisis right now, but we're moving in a direction where we could see real stress, and ultimately maybe a crisis, but I don't think we'll see an 08 type of event. Do you think there is much potential for those countries to return to being the engines of growth of the, the global economy that they once were? or? Do you think there are maybe perhaps some new kids on the block who might rise and take the take their places? Uh, I think the I think the emerging market countries are very positive for the future. The problem is if you're if you're point A and point B is the sunny uplands of huge success and so on, you have to get from point A to point B. Getting there from here seems to me to be a very painful process and could introduce a severe crisis that prevents you from getting to point B. But if you look at the populations, the growth of populations, the growth of aspirations around the world, the enormous markets that are in these countries, then you know these are places of the future. So, I mean, you spoke about the sort of the rise of, of nationalism and protectionism and such like. Um, I guess on related on that topic, especially here in Britain, um, in relation to the Britain's membership of the uh, e of the EU, um, kind of what are your what are your views on that? Do you think? What I would say about their position in the EU is that because of what's happened with the eurozone countries and the EU countries. Uh, those countries that are in the EU but not in the Eurozone, common currency, they will have increasingly diverse interests to those that are in, in the zone. So the Euro currency in itself has been quite successful. So from a banking standpoint, the currency is there and it works. People regard it seriously and so on. But I think the the potential of Europe to reach a really common basis on one managed banking system is pretty distant because that's very much a national issue still. But I do think because, because the Eurozone has expanded so much so quickly to such a diverse group of countries, large, small, um, you know, former communist countries, uh, the complexities of making Europe a nation uh, as opposed to a collection of countries with a common currency is extremely challenging because to have a common currency without an underlying common fiscal system is extremely challenging. Pass through the cars, it's not that way in Europe. Sort of not quite comparable, I guess. No, but I mean, if they're going to become a united national entity, a sovereign Europe, they do have to take these steps. Um, and I guess my final question is regarding your, your former capacity as U.S. ambassador to India. Um, you talked about India's growing economic clout. Um, do you think that will be inevitably accompanied by you know, more geopolitical power? And particularly given its position in in like that region, um, do you think it holds the key to any sort of solution, or has a huge role to play? In, and um, what, how would you describe that? Well, India has a very important role to play in the world because of its size. First of all, its physical size, like China, and its population, because 
something like 55% of the people in India are under the age of 24. So it is among the youngest countries in the world. In China, because of their policies, and their sort of, the average age, I guess, in India is about 24, and India is about, in China is about 32 or 33. And the, the demographics in the world today are that among a lot of the industrial countries, they are shrinking. Their young population is shrinking. India, not, not true. They still have a big young population that's aspirational, generally speaks English, is comfortable with technology. Uh, it is a democracy, a true democracy, which means it is a chaotic, chaotically governed country because it's in a way so democratic. China is more efficient if you want to talk about getting things done. But India is very stable. And Modi has announced what he calls a new foreign policy for India, which is to move from being what he calls a balancing factor diplomatically to a player, a sort of initiator of foreign policy initiatives. But they have to do two things. They have to make sure that their young population gets work, you know, employment, and health care and education. Because nothing causes unrest among younger people more than the inability to get a job or to raise a family with a appropriate health care. Thank you very much. It was such a pleasure to speak well, to you. Well, great. I'm happy I was able to do it.